Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on ultrasonic transducers, and specifically choosing an excitation signal. We'll begin with a recap of the transduction process. The ultrasonic pressure signal output from a transducer depends upon the transducer's intrinsic system transfer function and the excitation voltage. And the pressure output is the convolution of these two. Let's look at some transducer outputs as a function of impulsive excitation signal they experience. We'll begin by considering an idealized delta function. This is something that has a non-zero value at one instant in time only. Here, we can also see the transducer's impulse response. That's exactly what we see on its transducer output. Now we consider a square pulse. We have a copy of the transducer's impulse response from the leading edge and a time delayed version from the trailing edge. Notice here that because the trailing edge of the drive signal is negative going, we have a phase inverted version of the transducer's impulse response. And the transducer output is the combination of the two. Notice here that the width of the square pulse has been tuned to the frequency of the transducer. If we have an untuned pulse, in this case one which is much longer than the transducer's natural frequency, we again have a leading edge response and a trailing edge response, but the combination is now much longer and much lower in amplitude. We may also want to drive a transducer with a square pulse. Here we have our leading edge responses. From the middle of the square pulse, we have a double amplitude transition in, in the excitation signal. And this leads to a double amplitude impulse response copy. And finally, a third signal responding to the trailing edge. The output of the transducer, as we've seen in previous cases, is the combination of all of these. Notice here that we've had a very significant change in pulse shape, pulse duration, and pulse amplitude only by changing the impulsive excitation that we've used. One of the big advantages of driving a transducer with an impulse is its temporal resolution, the ability to resolve different signals as part of the time trace. Consider here a transducer that's being used to interrogate a sample. We'll be looking at this sample, pulse echo. So as the signal radiates from the transducer, some of that signal will reflect from the front surface of the sample and will be shown on the time trace. Some of the signal will propagate into the sample and reflect from its rear surface. That gives us a second pulse on the time trace. And there may be subsequent internal reflections which lead to subsequent pulses on the time trace. Even if the dimensions of the sample are very much smaller, because we're using a very short pulse, we still have very clear separation. This is very useful if we're in a thickness gating application, or if we're using the amplitude of reflected pulses to determine an image from within the sample, as we might find in diagnostic medical ultrasound. And here, short pulses are excellent for maintaining the ability to resolve small spatial features within the sample that we're looking at. However, one of the disadvantages with using an impulsive excitation occurs when there's any absorption in the medium that we're looking to propagate through. Consider here a signal that is being received on a hydrophone, a dedicated receiving device. In this case, the first signal is shown propagating through water and we can clearly see that the center frequency is close to 8 MHz and a very broad bandwidth. However, if we introduce just 5 mm of polymer sample in between the transducer that's radiating and the hydrophone that's receiving, we find a very much smaller signal, very different duration, and very much changed bandwidth, in this case with a center frequency close to 4 MHz. 
It's useful to note that because energy is proportional to pressure squared, the propagation through this polymeric sample has resulted in an energy reduction of more than 97%. So how might we get more energy into a sample of material that we're looking to measure? Again, considering our pulse signal that we saw previously, and we'll contrast it with that of a tone burst of the same amplitude. This is a very much longer signal and actually contains more than 20 times the energy. However, all of that energy is concentrated at one frequency, as opposed to the very broadband signal that we saw on the impulse. So we've got more energy into the sample, but as we've seen in our discussion of gain bandwidth product in previous tutorials on transducers, that energy is located now at one frequency or very narrow range of frequencies only. So how do we solve the problem of getting more energy in over a wider range of frequencies? Well, in this case, we would have to use a swept tone burst. We start off with a single tone burst at a particular frequency. And then by adjusting the function generator that's producing the signal, we can systematically increase the frequency. And as we sweep through frequency, we will find that there will be a change in amplitude corresponding to the transducer system function, and also a reduction in duration as we have shorter and shorter signals for the same number of cycles. But it's also important to realize that when we're looking at a real tone burst signal, as opposed to an idealized one, we know, may not be able to use all of it. Consider here a tone burst that is from a highly nonlinear waveform. We can see that the initial 12 or so cycles, there is a lot of change in amplitude. This is partly as the transducer achieves its steady state and partly as diffraction occurs within the wave field. Similarly, at the back of the pulse, we can see there's a lot of transducer ring down. So it's only the middle 13 to 24 cycles of this signal which are suitable in which to make measurements. It's also important to realize that with longer signals, we have the possibility for unwanted interactions. Consider here an idealized tone burst as shown. This is a low frequency wave of many cycles and in fact is of duration close to 150 microseconds. But because the measurement location is relatively close to the transducer, propagation delay between the transducer and the receiver is only 25 microseconds. If there's any unwanted electromagnetic radiation from the front face of the transducer, this will arrive almost instantly, as opposed to the acoustic signal, which was time delayed because of the propagation through water. And so what we see at our receiver is a combination of those two components. At the very beginning, we can see the contribution that's from the electromagnetic wave only. The interference of the acoustic and the electromagnetic signal result in a large portion in the middle. And the true acoustic amplitude is only really visible in the last few cycles. There may also be a problem if we're using a transducer with a broad radiation pattern. Consider here a transducer radiating into water. The direct path between the transducer and the receiving hydrophone is shown in blue. But if the transducer has a broad radiation pattern, there may also be an indirect path, here shown in red, that arises from reflections at either the water, air, surface, or at the tank edges. The two signals will arrive at the hydrophone and will interfere with one another, in much the way we'd seen in the previous slide. We could also see interactions of the direct wave with the mounting structures that are holding the hydrophone and therefore causing back reflections. The best way of trying to minimize these problems is to ensure that when we conduct transducer characterization, we use short signals. So to summarize, it's important to choose an excitation that is compatible with both the transducer and the measurement being conducted. And field characterization is always best done with short signals, even if the end use is continuous wave. We hope you found this interesting. If you did, 
come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorial videos.